like, who did Cain marry? And if you don't know the answer, you could seek me afterwards. The answer's right there. Another thing is, why did God put that terrible tree in the garden? The answer is, he didn't. He put all the trees in the garden, and they all were good. Remember when he said, everything that he put in the earth was all good. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, somebody messed with it. Anyway, there's, I'm amazed at how Christians today are operating in two houses. Everyone say two houses. I have two houses. Say it. Now, you might not. I'm not talking about physical houses. I'm talking about you have two covenants. That Bible on your lap has an old covenant and has a new covenant, doesn't it? Each covenant has a set of rules and principles, doesn't it? Here's where many Christians fail. And if you get mad at me, you can throw a rock at me later. Is they're trying to live from the Old Testament on Old Testament principles, kind of mixing it all in. And if you think about it, you're insulting Jesus Christ. Because Jesus came from heaven, became a man, then lived for 33 and a half years, died, rose again, and set a new covenant into operation. This is your new house. So when Christians mix the Old and the New Testament up, they're actually crossing the poles of their battery, negative and positive. Now, even you ladies know what happens when you cross the negative and the positive pole. It shorts it out and there's no power. And you'll see the Church of Jesus Christ in the last 20 years seem to have no power at all. A lot of noise, a lot of celebration, and that's good, but where's the power? Because we're trying to live from the old house, practicing new house rules. And so if I've confused you, I hope to stir you up. You see, the old term, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, is from the old house. The Lord giveth. He doesn't take away, unless it's your sin. But Job uttered that because he only understood from the old house. You see, in the Old Testament, people weren't born again. They did not have God in them. They were always wanting to God come and live with them, to tabernacle among them. Read your Bible. And then finally, God came in the likeness of his son, so that we could have Jesus in where? in our hearts. So you live in a new house, stop applying Old Testament rules and principles. You cannot work hard enough to be blessed. You surrender, accept Jesus, and you are blessed. Here's another fallacy. If you're trying hard to be somebody, quit. You already are in Christ. You already are somebody. You see the deception? He, the enemy tells you you're without, and yet Jesus says, I supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. You see, two set of rules. Satan knows that the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. Do you believe the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ? Raise your hands if you do. Those of you on camera, you better believe it. We're going to go to that scripture here in a minute as soon as they get it up. You're going to find out there's two sets of rules. And when you practice Old Testament rules, it does not work in the New Testament because you fall from grace, you slap Jesus in the face, and you say everything you did is not good enough, God. Now, I know we don't do that on purpose. We do that through ignorance, not knowing the will of the Lord. Hello? All right, don't look at me in that tone of voice. You guys kneel. So when you, I believe all scripture is given by inspiration of God. But in the Old Testament, you have to bring it into the New Testament ways of faith. Can you say amen? The people in the Old Testament made a mistake. If they even gossip, sister, the ground would open up and swallow them. You better believe you're in the New Testament. You don't believe me? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says that many of them, their bodies were slain in the wilderness because of their mouth. And all of their negative unbelief. Only those with faith got into the promised land. That was only two. 
Joshua and Caleb. One more thing I want to give you before we get into the word today. And that is something really, I don't know about you, but how was your time with God this morning? Oh, so rich. My time, I, I, I minister and I'm sitting with God first thing every morning. I have a, what's called a face-to-face -face relationship where God fixes me, adjusts me, fills me, quiets my mind, shuts my flesh down. So when I get up from prayer, I'm totally in the spirit. That means Satan can't touch me. Can't touch you either. But you've got to get into the habit of putting God first. Say amen. And when we do that, when we do that, understand this principle. I'm a studier of the word of God and I've been studying some of my heroes. Do you have certain teachers that you like better than others? I have some heroes. E.W. Kenyon was one of mine. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland. Um, uh, I'm a Copenhagen, if you think you want to look at me that way. I'm just a good old Christian. I believe in the word of God. I'm well taught. But one of the things that we do, and we don't realize we're doing it. How, everyone point to your head. Say, God does not dwell there. My head is not smart enough to figure God out. I'm not to lean to my own understanding. Okay, but now you got the humor of it. This is what we do when we don't mean to. We try to believe God with our head, and we don't know we're believing with our head. We're acknowledging God wants us. How many here believe God wants you healed? But if you only acknowledge it that he wants you healed, and you don't know how to appropriate it, you'll never get the healing. People, when they came to Jesus, they came to Jesus for what? For reasons of need, didn't they? They came to get their blind eyes fixed and their deaf ears and their bodies. They came to Jesus for these reasons. Jesus picked his disciples and only in several places did he go seek somebody out, like the woman at the well. But most people came to Jesus, they already had it in their mind that they were believing God, not from the head, but from the heart. And that heartfelt believer God will make you crawl through crowds, will make you scream and yell until you get your needs met. Are you that, that desperate? Are you just mentally agreeing? Oh, I know God wants me healed. Mental assent is what I'm calling it, or mental agreement. Folks, James said even the devils believe in God. Hello? So it's not just thinking that God is and God loves me. It's actually heartfelt following after him. Say amen, somebody. All right, we've been doing a series called New Creation Realities. This one here, and boy, I tell you what, if you're watching from camera, and I hope you are, this is how you can plant for your healing. This is how you can plant for your prosperity. This is how you can plant for your salvation. So what I'm about to teach you is a biblical New Testament principle that is taught throughout. But we must apply it properly. How many know there's a difference between the law and works and the principles of God? How many know you can't lie and cheat and expect God to bless you? Can't gossip what we learned last week, that gossip is Christian witchcraft. When you talk bad about somebody, you are putting a spell on them and yourself. That's why you're probably not doing very well. Oh, speak for yourself. I'm doing just fine. You see how you are? You have to talk for yourself. You need to die out to yourself. Hello. Say, ouch, oh, fire. All right. Now, remember, I love you dearly, but I'm trying to give you some things so you can get. I know so many people that are believing for healing in their body, but they don't know how to appropriate it. They don't know how to plant for that manifestation. There's so much confusion out there. A lot of times they're talking contrary, they prayed and asked God, and then they're speaking everything other than their, their faith and what they believe for. Say, oh no. So let me read you my paragraph, okay? So good morning, church family. Today we're going to share with you some of the wonderful principles of the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of God is the original, complete kingdom. Kingdom of heaven came at Pentecost in the earth for you and I. Say, I have a kingdom given to me by God in Christ. So you have a complete package given to you. Whether you get your hands on it or not, it's up to you in Christ. All right, so we are a product. Did you know this? A product of our choices. We make good choices and we make bad choices. So where you're at is a product of the different choices you made. The principles of the sowing and reaping need to be understood by you and I. How many know as a man soweth, so shall he also? So if you're sowing a lot of discord, a lot of hate, a lot of malcontent, what are you going to reap? Very good. So you, you have the ability to pray for a crop failure. If you've done a whole bunch of speaking and negative and talking and this and that, where you shouldn't have, you need to pray, God, neutralize those words so they don't form against me. Look at your neighbor and say, you better do it. Because basically, we formulate a chain bondage around our, our life by the words that we speak. Jesus said, even every idle word that you speak, you will give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, does Jesus lie to us? No. So let's understand the depths. So the principles of sowing and reaping, we must understand how it works and how God uses it in helping us. We could sow the right thing and reap the right thing, or we could sow the wrong thing and reap the wrong thing. So here's a little wisdom to shut down the weed feeder. Folks, Get a hold of your mouth early as a Christian. Get a hold of those things that you kind of want to say, but you know you shouldn't say. Christians have a physical, we have physical challenges. We're all, some of us, getting older. And as long as we are in the world, we're going to have problems. So don't think I'm saying you won't have any problems. No, but when they do come, you won't be so moved by them. And so... For example, how about healing? There are times we need healing. Do you know how to appropriate it? Hello? There are times we need answers to prayer like a bill needing met or some things being taken care of. Do you know how to believe and appropriate those things? You should be able to. Aren't you a covenant child? Don't you have a covenant with Almighty God where God says, I promise you, to give you all that I promised and that you could have all these things in Christ but we spend our time thinking of ourselves and fighting amongst ourselves that's not correct we should be going after Jesus seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and rejoicing over those that are doing the same amen we're all growing at different levels by the way so listen we have not because you and I ask not. Some of you might think, well, I don't want to bother God with the little things. Bother them. Because you don't have because you don't ask. You complain maybe, but you don't ask, God. You see? You're missing friends. People don't know how to trust you. Ask God to change you so you can have friends and you can be trusted. Somebody say Amen. I don't, I don't want you to you know, think I'm picking on you because I'm not. See, you, know, you and I, when we ask, we shall what? Come on, sleepy Christians. Ask and you shall. Receive. Seek and you shall. Right. Knock and the door shall be. He didn't say anything about not, did he? Let me read you this next scripture. Now listen to this. Listen. How many here are in Christ? Put your hands high. I'm in Christ. That means if you're in Christ... Everything God has for you and the promises are yours. There isn't any no. See, everybody thinks, well, sometimes I ask and God says no. Well, you ask a mess because you're asking selfishly. If you're in Christ, everything you ask is granted to you. But you have not because you're not requesting it. You didn't get saved until you asked to be saved. You didn't get prosperous until you asked to be prosperous. 
You didn't get forgiven until you asked to be forgiven. I have people mad at me because I tell them what you need to do is rededicate yourself to the Lord and ask God to help fix you and cleanse you. Stop picking on me. Okay, then suffer. Hello. I'm sorry. You have to do it God's way. You can't be like Cain. Cain was a murderer. His deeds were evil. He had a boogaloo fastened to his brain says, kill your brother. I know Christians today can't even fellowship with one another because they have boogaloos in their brains telling them they can't, nobody loves them. Now cast that thing off of yourself. Say amen. All right, I love you. So today we're going to learn how to receive your answers, miracles, healing, how to get those things that are promised to you in your life where you need them. Say amen. Many people today have been taught that church is just a place to go like a club. And we have giant churches, the great big huge entertainment programs. And you know, that's good as long as they're getting Jesus. But I find with a lot of them, they're just going to be entertained and they're not going to sit at Jesus' feet like, Marth, like Mary did. But instead, they're just going and they're having a great time and that's great. But when God pulls us all and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, God the Father is going to say, Carrie, what did you do with my son? And all my life is going to flash before me. And everything I did with Jesus is going to come up. Everything I did for myself is going to burn up. And, and God's going to say, okay, you had all these rewards, but you only get these rewards because you were really selfish over here. But because you followed me, I will reward you according to your heart and not according just to your works. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. So a lot of us thinking we're going to get some big mansion. You just might get a cabin. Because you've been too busy criticizing everything instead of following after God and making him the apple of your eye and letting him become your friend. I know of thousands of thousands of Christians preached with a lot of good ones. Very few have I found that allowed God to become their friend. And those are the ones that move in power. So make a decision. You want God as your friend. He lives in you after all. Let me give you this quick explanation. You know, I love my father. I had a good father. Not perfect, good. But it wasn't until later on that I became his friend. I always was his boy. I always was his son. But it took a little bit of a while for me to just communicate because that I could become friends with him. And boy, I tell you, the last part of his life, we were like buddies. That's how God wants you to be with him. He wants you to put all this religious junk aside, all this trying to be somebody aside, and meet with him and be with him so he can make you into who he wants you to be. Remember, he's placed everybody in the body as it pleases him. Okay? And not as pleases us. All right, are you with me? Let's look at this scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. It's a very good one. In fact, you should put this on your mirror in the bathroom. Move it aside with all the other ones you got on your mirror in the bathroom. <laughs> See, when I was studying for the ministry, I had a little baby house. It just it was an old chicken coop that was born again. And on the roof, it was the roof was only like seven feet tall. Keep the heat in. But when I would get up in the morning, I put scripture, tag it right up in there. So when I opened my eyes, I would see you're a champion. Greater is he that's in you. This kind of thing. To remind me of who I was in Christ. Because certainly other things were trying to tell me I'm something else. <clears throat> so, listen to this. 2 Corinthians 1, 20 and 22. For all the promises of God. How many? In him are Yes. What are they? Yes. And in him, amen. That means so be it. To the glory of God through him, or through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ 
and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts. Can you say amen? As a guarantee. You're guaranteed heaven. Pastor Kerry, now don't get mad at me, those watching from camera, because we, see this church might be not huge here, but we're spread out now in other states all over. That's what God's purpose was for us. Now other places, they have large churches and large places, and that's great too, that's wonderful. So we reach out. So the purpose that God has for you is to give you the understanding so you, you won't trip up in your relating with him. Can you say amen? You know, God is so wonderful that he cares enough for us. For example, believing is from the heart, not from our head. That is wishing. If you're a wisher, beggars would ride. Oh, I wish I had, I wish I did, I wish I wish I wish I wish. Wish comes from the head, has no substance. Your head can't manufacture anything but worry. It comes from the heart, faith comes out of the spirit. When you pray, don't pray from here, pray from here. But you got your faith, your character in what you pray. Slow down, make your words like brush strokes in Jesus' name. When you learn to do that, you move mountains. When you learn to do that, you pluck up things that are in the way. See, a mountain back in the days of Jesus was an obstacle. When Jesus said, say to this mountain, be removed, even though he was meaning a real mountain, he was saying, the, ob the obstacles in your life, say to them, get out of the way. I have God in me. And they will have to obey you. God in you. You're not going to smart that mountain away. Releasing God, releasing God. Get up in the morning, meet with God, release God. Get up in the morning, meet with God, release God. Look at your neighbor and say, I think he's talking about me. I think he's really talking about me. So we need to understand. If we, we don't allow God to change us, then what we're going to do is we're going to have a, an average Christian walk. And God doesn't, he didn't send his son, his son Jesus to die for you to give you an average walk. He gave you everything. All the promises of God are what? Are what? So guess what? God is not going to withhold a promise from you. He said, I will prosper you. Now let me ask you, do you believe that? That doesn't convince me, you wimps. Well, yeah, you have to really go after it. Now, I'm, I'm only teasing you because most of you are my family. But see, that's where we're at. We're mentally assenting. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When your heart's got God in it, get God out of your heart into the areas that you need him say amen. So all of the promises are yes. So don't even doubt them. Just start claiming them, asking for them, asking God to enrich your life, help you to be who you, God wants you to be. Say amen. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Talking about holding fast to those prayers and those promises. Seeing that we have a high priest, a great high priest. Who's that, folks? It's Jesus. Where does he live? In your heart. See, a lot of the Bible was written from a Jewish mindset, which is okay. But see, they had no conception of Jesus being in their heart. That's why God chose Paul. He chose Paul the apostle to bring in the gospel of God indwelling us. But Christ in us, the hope of glory, the rapture of the church is a Paul revelation. These were hidden in the Old Testament. They had no idea of them. So a lot of the writings, you will, you will see this, like the book of Hebrews in a, is in a Jewish mindset. Listen to what it says. Seeing that we have a great high priest <laughs> who has passed through the heavens. Who went through the heavens? Folks, you've got to see the beauty of this. Jesus Christ was born in the earth, wasn't he? 
Did you know every human being born in the earth is imprisoned here? Since the fall of Adam and Eve, every human is imprisoned on the earth until they accept Christ or have faith in God. Then they're given a ticket. It's accounted to them for righteousness. And then they can escape. But if you'll remember in the Old Testament, where did all the Old Testament saints first go? They went to the earth, into Abraham's bosom, paradise. I wish you would pay closer attention. So they were sitting in paradise, thousands upon, tens of thousands of them. And Jesus was born. Jesus rose and at the age of 30 was anointed. Spirit of the Lord's upon me. He went and lived for three and a half years and he fulfilled all righteousness. Then he took our sins, our sicknesses, and he died. Rose again from the dead. But it says when he rose again from the dead, he led captivity captive, all those that were in Abraham's bosom, and he left through the heavens. He was the first to leave this planet after the fall of Adam. That's why he's called the firstborn from among the dead. Because he left this planet, we can leave this planet too if we put our faith in Jesus. So all the people on the earth are in bondage. Oh yeah, it's sin, 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 sin. There you go for looking at sin. No, they're in bondage because Jesus died for them too. Are you sharing the good news to those that are bound to earth? They have no help of heaven? Are you busy picking on the Christians that are trying to do the same? You see how Satan has duped so many Christians? If you're looking for my perfection, stop. I don't have any. But if you're looking for God in me, just listen. Your lives will change because of the word, not because of my charming personality or I can play the drums. Pay attention. God wants his people trained this hour because the church is wandering around somewhere playing church, having concerts, and that's wonderful. I haven't got a thing against them. I love good Christian concerts, but who's training the Christians? All right. That was just the introduction. You ready? Okay. We're going to cover these four areas. Take some notes. Number one, have, do you have a need? Then you plant the seed. You need a healing in your body? Find the scripture. Read it. Speak it. Believe it. Talk to God about it. It's a seed. You have a need, plant the seed. Get out of your head and get it into your heart, the good ground. Say amen. Now listen to this scripture. This is a good one. And he said, the kingdom of heaven, as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Verse 27, Mark 4. And should sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields itself, first the blade, then the head, and that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens and immediately puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. That's talking about how the kingdom of God works in you, whether you know it or not. You say you need healing, so you find some healing scriptures. Lord, all your promises are yes, so I know healing is mine. Nor I get past my head and I begin to quote out loud, by his stripes I am healed. He in his own self bear my own sins in his own body on the tree, that I being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by his stripes I am healed. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised. And, and if you can't do what I just did, because it's been years of, of that, get a pocket promise book. All the promises of God's scripture are in there for you. They're all yes. Don't look at me that way. They're all yes. And because you haven't gone after it, you don't know how to claim it and get it into the heart where it grows. You can't plant it in your head. You'll forget about it. 
How many of you remember the story of Gideon's army? How God reduced Gideon's army from all these thousands of men down to 200? And what the very last thing that God filtered them is he sent them to go drink, didn't he? Half of them drank by sticking their head in the water and being totally self-centered to get a drink. The others being alert, lapped it out of their hands, watching in case the enemy snuck on them. Which one did he pick? The ones that were alert and lapping it out of their hands. What's wrong with the church is they got their face in everybody's problem. They got their face in this and they got their face in that. You are not Jesus. Get your face out of other people's business. Get it back where it belongs and ask God what he wants you to do. Do nothing more or nothing less. And then the rest of the time, enjoy yourself. He gave you a business. He gave you things to enjoy. But do your homework first. Say amen, somebody. So everything else comes in line so we can orchestrate it for you. Remember, he loves you and you're the apple of his eye. All right? So we will cover. If you have a need, plant a seed. The word was promised. Second thing we'll cover, ask and believe you received it. And you shall have it. Believe you received it already, whether you see it or not. Most people believe they receive it until they, then they start feeling for it. Are looking for it. You're already deceived. Let's do it again. You see, our eyes don't look at the temporal. They look at the eternal. And when we believe and we pray and we ask God, he says, yes, then you got the seed right here. Watch your mouth. Watch what you do because that seed's going to germinate and it's going to bring it to pass. That is if you don't mess it up. You mean we can, Pastor Kerry? Yes, we can. That's Satan's job, to get you in your head. So you're contrary to your faith of your spirit and your heart. Third thing we'll cover is hold fast to the faith, your confession of faith without wavering. So first one is, have a need, plant a seed. Second one is, ask and believe you received it, you shall have it. Third one is, hold fast your faith, having a good confession and of course, the fourth one, we must keep our eyes focused on the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that brings it to pass, not us. We think if we got to hurry, you know, God gives us this thing and asks us to do this, and then we got to hurry up and get it done. No, you ask him how he wants you involved. Remember, God removes the stress from our life when we meet with him. God doesn't want to stress. That's how we get gray hair. That's how we age. Things break down in our body. He wants us at rest, not in stress. And you'll find out when you're in rest about things and not all worked up, there won't be any mess. Because <laughs> you won't mess up. All right. You know I love you. All right. Let's get through this real quick. All right. If you have a need, plan a what? Folks, how many here could use more finances? Then you should know every financial scripture in that Bible. Should be speaking it out loud. Should be walking through your house declaring your covenant. Understand? If you don't do those things, then God thinks you're not serious. Which he knows you are. But you got to get beyond yourself and do what he asks you to do. If you don't pro proclaim it, you can't get it. How did you get Jesus from out here into your heart? Well, sure you asked. You spoke a man. Now, here's the crux. You continue every day to speak a man. You don't get born again every day. You get more of God every day. You speak him into your life more and more and more and more. You ask God to show you the dark places where you're not asking God to come in. Remember, he's a fixer, not a condemner. Say, oh me, somebody. You need healing in your body. Cancer, this situation, that situation, 
find the scripture where it says, read it out loud to yourself. Talk to God about it. Claim the promises. Now you've got the seed in you. Praise him and worship him until the seed takes over in your life. The seed is healing. Prosperity. God shall supply all of your need, not needs, need, according to his riches and glory. So he's the supplier, but you've got to be the good ground, on good ground. He that received the, the seed with gladness and patience produces 30, 60, 100 fold and gets the results. The other grounds, wayside ground, thorny grounds, rocky ground, means that you're too into what you're doing to get enough of the word in you to produce any results. They enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Are you getting anything out of this? Of course you are. So, plant the seed for the need. Go with me to Psalms 37, verse 4 through 7. Meanwhile, what do we do, Sherry? Meanwhile, what do we do, Joel? Let's see what the scripture tells us. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Oh, but I have financial need. My body hurts. I need healing. Get your eyes off of you and delight yourself in the Lord. That's the problem. As long as you're focused on you, you're blocked. Look at your neighbor and say, oh me. You run to the medicine cabinet instead of the Lord first. It's okay. Just bring God in on your pills. I take pills, but I take them in Jesus' name. Hello? No guilt. Work even better. <laughs> Listen, listen, listen. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. His promises. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Who's bringing their seed to pass? Who's bringing your healing to pass? Who's bringing your prosperity to pass? God is. Where does God live? He lives in you, for it is God who works in you to do his good will and his good pleasure. Sit down, be quiet, and let him work. Say amen, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say he's talking about you. You know I am. You're the squirrely one. You're, you're Miss Spiritual. You sit back and correct everybody. No, I'm just joking. None of you are that way. I hope you've outgrown that babiness. You thought I was talking about you, didn't you? You see how people come to church and they go, what's the pastor going to say about me? You see, you're already guilty. You should have had that covered in prayer before you got here. Moving right along, I'm joking with you. I love you. It's time the church really do some growing. We got a bunch of babies. How are we going to have a revival when all they can do is <laughs> and they got problems every day no Jesus is the answer to our problem meet with him and he'll fix it do you realize I've never had such a good time in my entire life every time I tried to do it on my own I failed but every time I surrendered I said Lord you got to do this he says thank you and here's your part Lord you got to do this he'll say thank you and now here's your part Keep him out in front. When Satan looks at you, he shouldn't see you. He should see Jesus. Aren't we hidden in Christ? I said, aren't we hidden in Christ? Well, how in the world does Satan know it's you? Because you're big a mouth and you're just fully worth of heaven. You be quiet and be still and know that he's God. Satan won't even know it's you. He'll see Jesus walking around and you and Jesus. He can't look through Christ. Don't you know that? There's a place that you can go, Satan can't go. That's in the spirit realm, your prayer closet. Satan doesn't listen to your prayers. He can't. But you think he does. 
No, it's what you say after you pray to everybody you talk to would tips him off. When I say Father in Jesus' name, Satan becomes blind and deaf to what I'm doing. Now think about that. As a missionary, when I went into Haiti, first thing we did is we said Father in Jesus' name and we were completely cloaked. We walked into uh, voodoo temples and we walked into the capital of Haiti and claimed it for God. We did all kinds of crazy things. Normally, we would not have been able to do until we got the revelation of how we are hidden in Christ in God. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Read it. Memorize it. My second point. Ask and believe you receive it. How many know you have to believe you receive it? That means you don't talk against it. You don't think against it. You, you have it as a seed inside of you. Don't dig it up the next day. Oh, I hope God heard my prayer. Dig. Yeah. Yelling at your husband. Dig. Come on now. It's a, your personal walk with God, not you correcting everybody else's personal walk. Our personal walk, asking God to fix us, straighten us so that what God does for us is a real blessing. Can you say Amen. I have, I have a, I think I teach people, it's really hard to teach, but sometimes if everywhere you go, there's a problem. And everywhere you, now listen, this is not you, but this is just a, a, some wisdom. Everywhere you go is a problem, and you're with different people, but there seems to always be a problem wherever you go. What's the common denominator? Yeah. Yeah. So if there seems to be a problem everywhere you go, Get that taken care of with God. So people re-love you and receive you and not reject. You see, meeting with God is your cure. It's not going to work anywhere, anywhere else. It's just not going to work. You know, I was a very successful minister and I still am. But I crashed because people put me on a pedestal. They looked at my flesh to be the answer. We're not supposed to look at man at all. We're supposed to look at God. And, I, and it set me up. It just set me up for a big crash. And here's the other correct, sir. Every one of you have crashed. Some of you think you got away with it. Look at me. That's because nobody knew that you crashed. But for us, I'm pointing at myself who crashed, who was supposed to be everybody's hero, you pray for the church to forgive somebody like me because if I am their judgment, if they can't love and accept me to come back, they'll be judged. And do you know the reason why the world goes through a tribulation? I bet you you don't. Because of our rudeness to the Jews and our rudeness to the Christians. The world's rudeness to the Jews, the world's rudeness to the Christian. So you as Christians, you don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to, to make excuses for yourself when people want to start picking on you. Smile and say, you're in trouble. Just smile at them. Say, you're in big trouble. They'll say, yeah. I says, you're picking on God. You're not God. No, but I carry him. You're looking at my flesh when you should be seeing the Lord. Now, folks, by saying that, that's where Jesus said, when you get slapped on one cheek, turn to him the what? Turn to him the other. Most people don't understand that. When you turn to him the other, God steps in and says, oh, no, you won't do that. You see, when the the Roman soldier took the cloak and then the underwear of the, the Hebrew... And, and it says, if he asks for your cloak, give him your, your undergarments also. And it says, walk with him a mile. And then give it back to him. Instead of fighting the system all the time and attacking it and being unrighteous about it, yield and let God step in. It says, for the first mile, a Roman soldier might have you. But the second mile, you have the Roman soldier. Because your kindness have carried it an extra mile. Hope you got that. 
Our Christianity should not be a reactant, should be a response of love. Say, oh me, everybody. I love what Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says. You stay in Mar you stay in ask and believe, okay? It says, be anxious for nothing. Does God want us, does God want us anxious? What's anxious? Don't worry. Where does worry come from? Does it come from your spirit? It comes from your head because you don't cast your cares and your thoughts over on him. You're carrying him around. Your head is a computer. And enough garbage in is going to start spilling out. Garbage in and garbage out. Every night, cast your cares over on the Lord, all your worries, all your anxieties, and learn that all things through prayer and supplication, that means lifting up the word before God. With thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God will keep your mind and hearts in Christ Jesus. But if you don't pray, your head's going to go for a loop. Satan will see to it. I mean, I, I followed my head a lot of places. Not a good place. All right, are you with me? Folks, now that we are born again, we have God living where? And you are where? You're at the right hand of the Father. Never forget that. Two, once we have asked and believed that we possess the promise... It comes in seed form, then we water it, we feed it until it comes to fruition or maturity. Healing is one, prosperity. All these promises are like seed. Grab them, hold them, nurture them, feed them, and let them bring forth a harvest. Say amen. All right, go with me to Mark 11, 22 through 24. This is one of my favorite verses. Kenneth Hagin is the one that first started sharing this with me. He uh, got off his deathbed at nine years old through this scripture. He had a blood-borne disease and he was dying. And he kept quoting this scripture, kept believing this scripture, kept quoting this scripture like a seed, nurturing it, watering it, feeding it, and Kenneth Hagin got out of his bed. Hope you are watching by camera, are, are, are catching how to get yourself healed before God. So Jesus answered and said to them, what happened was they had cursed a fig tree and a bunch of the disciples noticed and on the next day they came by and they said, oh, the fig tree's already dying. And Jesus did that to prove a point about how powerful they learned to speak from their spirit will be. So he says something like this. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou into the, planted into the sea, and does not what? Where should doubt come from? Head or heart? Head. Shut your head down. When you pray, believe, when you pray, believe that you receive, shut your thinking down. If you can't say, so I can't, it just wants to think, think, then open your mouth and say, praise the Lord. Your head will shut right up. Listen what your mouth has to say. Know yourself. The problem is many humans don't know themselves. Some of you, you need to pray and ask, you to, ask God to get you in tune with your body. Why? Because your body is telling you how much to eat, how much not to eat, when you're not feeling well, when it's not, and we're not in tune with our body, we just keep feeding it, bathing it, and sleeping it, and we don't listen to what it's telling us. God puts you that machine in you to tell you some things, like you need to get rest, and you need to not overeat, and these kind of things. We need to listen to that. You can't keep breaking those things and expect to be a man or woman of faith. Come on. Everyone smile. So we love you, Pastor. Oh, yes, we do. We love you, Pastor. It's true. 
I love you guys so much. These are things that I've been praying and fasting and really seeking God to give the body for years. And when I was down and out and broken and rejected, God kept feeding me these things I want the body to know. And so how could I keep my mouth shut in these last days? He said, I would open you up like a gift and just share what I've given you. So I can't help but doing that. So here we go. So when you pray, believe that you receive it and you show what? Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Let me give you a couple of points. Number one, now that we're born again, when we pray, we pray from our spirit man. Say new creature, God creature. God creature, new creature. See, so in your spirit, God is. You're a new creature. God doesn't live on the left side of your spirit, and you live on the right side of your spirit. And that's some of the false teaching of some of the churches in Tacoma. No, God mixed his spirit with your spirit, took out Adam's spirit, and made us one substance, one species. The problem is we're living from here and not from our heart. You've got to learn every step you take, everything you do to slow down and move from your spirit, man. You ever watch Catherine Coleman when she preached? Hi, everyone. What's she doing? She's bringing out God, everything she says. And she's up there in the balcony. Someone's getting healed. She released God over there in the balcony. You watch these people. I'm starting to send you clips of these people. The secret of their power. How to enter the secret place. Folks, pay attention. A revival is here. But you'll never get in on it in the flesh. It has to be in the spirit realm. Listen to this scripture. It's very familiar in John 15. It says this. Verse 7. I am the vine and you are the branches. Say amen. He who abides, stays, dwells in me, and I in him bears much fruit. Now you see the answer. That's the key. No fruit, no with God. No with God, no fruit. Two, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire and it shall be given unto you. Did you hear a no? There's no no there. Yet religion would say, yeah, well, God might just say no. Maybe it's not time yet. Get your head out of the way. That's what that is. It's your head trying to figure out how God's going to answer your prayer. That's none of your business. You prayed, you asked, you believed, you received. Then you thank. Then you move on to other things. And you rejoice when it shows up. Many times when I lay hands on, on sick people, they get healed instantly, but not everyone. Because the ones that are more seeped in the word, that know more of the word than the young babies, oftentimes God will let them take their, their faith. And as they leave, they're healed. Or as they obey, go wash in the pool of, of you know, Siloam, and they were healed. The older Christians, God expects you to act on the word. The younger ones, snap, dangle, pop. He'll hit you, heal you right away to get your attention. Learn that. Have you gotten anything so far? Good. This is a good one, man. God got, woke me up to this deal. All right. So we have, you have a need, plant a seed. Two, ask and believe you receive. Say amen. And then third point, Hold fast to what you believe. So let's go with me to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Here we go. Seeing or understanding that we have a great high priest that has passed from the heavens or passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, what? Come boldly 
to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Ask and you shall. This is our face-to-face -face relationship. You see, all the knowledge and all the insight to the word of God are in the face of Jesus. And if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest at any time the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto us. So we go to meet with God so that he could amplify the spiritual revelations that God gives us in his word. I take his word to God and say, Lord, show me. And that's when he showed me lots of things. I said, what about this scripture here, God? And God said, you want to see it? Boom. So I said, Father, in Jesus' name, he, he showed me a picture. He showed me the Holy Spirit putting me into Christ and Christ taking me all up before the throne of God and seating me while he sits down with the Father. All in a split moment of a millisecond. Second. Got to get my, my mouth to work. Father in Jesus' name. But I like to see in pictures. I like to see exactly what happens. He says, son, when you say Father in Jesus' name, I shield you. If you read the Psalms and you read all the scripture, it says that I'm a shield and a buckler. It says I'm a strong tower. You run into me. He says, you dwell in my shadow, my influence. What part of that says you're hanging out where the devil can shoot holes in you? It says, I'm not. You're not believing my gospel. Believe my gospel. It's perfect protection for the believer and child of God. You're a clothed in light. Can Satan look at light? Wimpy. You're clothed in light. Can Satan look at light? No. So guess what? If he's on your case, you're not clothed in light. Somehow you got out from under the grace. Get back into that place. And my last point with you. We must keep our eyes focused on Christ so that we don't mess up our harvests. And we do that. The enemy uses all kinds of things to distract us. Remember, he's a glittery, flashy flash. Everything he does is glittery and flashy. Okay? God is that way, but he is, Listen, I'm going to describe God. God is passive aggressive. Satan is flashy, braggart, and a con artist. You can see the two. Whatever, if you, if you know something is telling you, you better hurry up and you got to get this done, blah, 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 where you, you're losing all your peace, that's not God. God never pushes, he leads. Come on, come on. And for some of us, it's, hey, wake up, I'm over here. <laughs> come on, let's all identify. Amen, all right. So we must keep our focus on Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and finishing with you. Verse 16 through 18. Are you guys get there? Okay. I'm going to read you this scripture. It says, and having a high priest over the house of God, which house you are. Remember I started off and told us that we were in two houses. We have an old house that sits in the backyard called the Old Testament. And we have a new house that we're dwelling in, which we are learning how to use all the amenities. Did you know in the new house you have running water? You have servants. They're called angels. You have command switch. Lights on. Lights off. Because the kingdom of God is the house of God that you dwell in. So we have a high priest of the house of God. Who is he? Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the water. And let us hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering.
Okay? So if you prayed, you believed, you received, then you shall have. You shouldn't even doubt that it's not coming. In fact, I take, listen, I take the doubts that Satan gives me. Now, maybe you're not this way, but I can recognize when he, when he talks. He's full of doubt and unbelief. He's like a brick. <laughs> yeah, but watch out. You could be. <laughs> I figured out that if Satan has to lie to me about what I believe, he's a liar, isn't he? Come on, look at me. He's a liar. So he doesn't have any truth in him. So he, if he's telling me it's not working, what is it doing? It's working. And the more he lies to your head, the more happier you should be. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Satan, you're just tipping me off because you can't stop. See, Satan can't stop the seed from growing to harvest. Only you can. So he tries to draw you away and to contradict yourself. Someone say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm too smart now. So listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Don't give up. For even though our outward man is perishing, Yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For yet the light affliction, all of the troubles of the world, which is but for a moment, is working far for a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We're dying to ourselves, but we're living unto God. While we do not look at what? The things which are seen. Everyone look around you. Get your eyes off me. Go on. <laughs> we look at the eternal, don't we? We look at Jesus. Are you trying to cue me? Good. You're so cute. Got my attention. Anyway, I'm talking to my wife, just in case you want to know. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Joanna, you can relax. <laughs> it's a joke. All right. So here we go. Now catch this, okay? For we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen for the things which are are seen they're going to be temporary they're going to go away but the things that are not seen are what eternal so we focus through the word onto christ don't we hebrews 11 1 says without faith it's impossible to please god for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him that was verse 6 also amen so let's think about it you have a need, what do you do? Plant the seed. Then you guard that seed because God brings it up to fruition. Right? You believe, you ask, you believe your seed, and it shall be yours. Why? Because the promises of God are always yes and amen. Yes and amen. So remember, Satan's a master at religion. He'll sell you religion, a placebo, and not have you have a deep personal relationship. My job is to see you have a deep personal relationship, and then when we get to heaven, you'll thank me. Right now, I don't want to be your pal. I want to be your teacher and your coach, what I'm supposed to be. Later on, you want to become a friend? That's great, but know this. I am who I am. There's no difference. There's not Carrie, who's a backslider over here, and then the Carrie who serves God over here. No, I'm all pastor through and through. That means if you want to be my friend, don't act like a jerk because I'm going to correct you. <laughs> Which means my friendships are about like that. Hello? You see, once I say you're my friend, now listen, which I have every one of you. Of course, it might not mean a whole lot to you, but it does to me. That means it doesn't matter what you do. You will always be my friend. I don't base my friendship on your performance or how good or not so good you are. But I will base my closeness on how friendly you are. You could be a friend living in Alaska and hate my guts. I'm still your friend. You might not like that, but I still pray for you and I still befriend you. Let me ask you, did Jesus throw you away when you, dro when you dropped the ball? Is he your friend? There's a friend that stick it closer than a brother. Get the right idea of friendship. It means to be real 
and to have boundaries, but to understand it's not a performance thing. Another thing for Christians, and this is it, don't compete. Please don't compete with one another. Okay? You're the only one like you. So how can I be you if I'm me? So watch out from the foolish tricks of the enemy, always telling you have not, always telling you you're going to be someone someday, and just throw it all in the trash and build a deep abiding relationship with God. Guaranteed, you won't miss one of what God wants to show you. If you give the Lord a praise, we have-